Lights in the marshes and weird apparitions. Strange knocks and whispers in the night. Let's talk about ghosts. Hello everyone, Funky Monkey here. Welcome to today's episode. We already covered werewolves, vampires and ghouls and it is now only natural that we go through the history of ghosts. They are present in all human cultures and have a very very comfy place both in folklore and in pop culture. They can be found in books, in video games, TTRPGs, movies, everywhere. And in comparison to werewolves, vampires and ghouls, creatures that people are pretty sure don't exist, when it comes to ghosts, the jury isn't in yet. At least for some people. I am sure that there are some of you out there watching this video who actually believe in ghosts. And I can't say I blame you. They are perhaps some of the most terrifying creatures that the human imagination ever came up with. And they can explain a myriad of strange encounters and occurrences. As a disclaimer, there will be some chilling details, there will be some graphic depictions, but nothing compared to what details I gave about vampires, ghouls and werewolves. But still, if you don't want to hear about creatures that have haunted and hunted humanity since times immemorial, I think you should click away after this disclaimer and the introduction of the miniatures. I won't hold it against you, I promise. But give me the chance to convince you to stay. I don't like these kind of details either, believe me. I don't get easily spooked and I've excavated the necropolis I did a physical anthropology internship working with skeletons from prehistory and from medieval times and trust me, I've never been haunted. Just to be clear, I really don't believe in any supernatural creatures, be them vampires, werewolves, ghouls, fairies, ghosts, goblins or pixies. When I was younger, when I was a kid, I used to believe in all these supernatural creatures. It was cool. It was interesting. It allowed me to explain a lot of things. That scared me. And I think that the idea of ghosts stuck with me the longest. But once I started studying more and the moment I stopped believing in them, weird things stopped happening around me. I look at these details as nothing more than pieces of folklore, pieces of history, stories that were used to convey a message, teach a life lesson, enthrall and thrill the audience, or simple bedtime stories created to scare the living shit out of children in behaving. And this is how I recommend you look at these details. Now, give it a go, stick around, and whenever you feel it's too much for you, you can always click away. But I think you will find the stories I will tell you more interesting rather than scary. Now, before we start diving through the history of ghosts, let me talk about the miniatures I will be painting today. Yet again, I found myself lacking the appropriate miniature that goes well with the theme of the video. So I went with the closest thing I could think of. So I went with a bodak, although not a ghost, it is an undead supernatural creature. And the end of the first stretch in my series of dark creatures, it will be a double feature, with the second miniature being a nightmare. Let me tell you what my plans for them are and then we can get started. For the bow deck, I went with a zenithal priming using Ceramite White over Abaddon Black, but this time directly from above and not from somewhere to the left of the miniature. I'm trying to simulate noon sun overhead. I will go with a grey skin with deep shadows and crimson eyes and a very worn sun bleached Zamesi desert robe. With a nightmare, on the other hand, I will experiment a little using acrylic inks. I've never used them before, so it's going to either be a great success or an epic failure. I hope it turns out okay. Either way, it's going to be a learning experience. Okay, with my plans laid out, let us go through the checklist before we get started. I have a bit of coffee in my mug. I have a very tasty tea in my mousse cup. And I have something that goes well with the theme of today's video, 
something to steal the nerves and as you can see it is a cool ectoplasmic supernatural color. Oh, I also have my lovely assistant with me, keeping me company and allowing me to easily navigate the ghost stories. How about you? Are you all settled in and ready for a story? Awesome, let's begin. Because there are so many different ghost stories and so many different hang on, my assistant is getting restless. Okay, so. Because there are so many ghost stories and many types of ghosts peppered throughout human cultures, I will stick with the most generic and basic of ghosts, go through their story and uncover their origins, and in order to identify these basic ghosts, I will rely on the examples given in the Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition monster manual, just to make sure that I talk about some of the more well-known ghosts. Now, if you don't know what a ghost is, it's quite simple. It is the spirit or the soul of a deceased animal or individual that makes an appearance before living people. They can take a variety of shapes and forms ranging from an invisible presence that simply instills fear and dread to wispy apparitions to silhouettes barely distinguishable to full physical manifestations to simple occurrences such as um, item being moved or knocked over, gusts of air or sudden breezes where there shouldn't be any, weird sounds, knocks, whispers in the night, etc. The list goes on and on. This is why I consider ghosts to be truly universal entities and perhaps some of the most terrifying creatures that the human mind ever concocted. They are so terrifying because they represent the fear of unknown, the fear of death, our fear of the dark, of being hunted by unseen creatures or entities, and they can sometimes, or most likely most of the times, be the figment of a very tired mind, something we are all confronted with at least once in our life. In order to understand why a spirit of a deceased individual or an animal appears before the living, we first need to understand what worshipping or honoring our ancestors means and what are the core beliefs that allow ghosts to exist. Ghosts and the belief in any kind of afterlife have gone hand in hand since humanity's infancy. The belief is that if the dead aren't properly taken care of, if rights aren't correctly followed, or even if crimes aren't punished, will result in the spirit of the individual coming back and haunting the living has been very deeply ingrained in our collective memory, and for good reason. As it happens with all or most dark creatures that haunt our imaginations and our nightmares, they were created to better pass down knowledge and lessons and wisdoms throughout millennia. Now, there are two kinds of ghosts, the benevolent and the malevolent ghosts. Benevolent ghosts can take the shape of guardian spirits, for example, usually ancestors that look after their descendants or their community, while malevolent ghosts are usually restless spirits that have either unfinished business or were individuals that died a violent and usually mysterious and untimely death or those that were not taken care of after death. These usually come back and torment the living. In most human cultures, the belief that the spirits of the ancestors linger on to protect their community or descendants is very widespread. Honoring one's ancestors has been and still is a very important aspect of humanity as a species, as a whole. This form of honoring stems from the love for the deceased and the belief that they can still have an impact on the lives of, well, the living. Depending on the time period and the culture, this form of veneration, of honoring one's ancestors, came in different shapes and forms. 
I won't be spending a lot of time talking about prehistory because the information that has survived to this day is pretty sparse and I don't really know that much about prehistory and because the way cultures venerated or honored their ancestors differed so widely from one part of the world to the other or even from one community to the other that it doesn't really make sense to spend all that time talking about it. I will instead give you two examples that have stuck with me since my early days of university. One comes from a culture here in Europe that used to worship and honor their ancestors and their dead by ritually consuming their flesh upon death, thus making sure that the spirits remain with the community to protect and guide them and assure that the abilities and strengths of the deceased individual remain within the community. And the second example comes from a nomadic prehistoric um, culture that used to tie up their deceased in a fetal position and leave them in the wilderness away from the community as a means of appeasing their souls and making sure that the community is kept safe. And with that, let us move closer to our time period and to a society that we know more of and that you would easily recognize, the ancient Egyptians. For them, the veneration and honoring of their ancestors was very important, and this is how the rite of mummification came to be. The idea was that the body had to be very well preserved so that the soul of the deceased, the Ka, could return to it and accept offerings brought to them. If mummification was not affordable, as it was the case in most situations, a statue in the likeness of the deceased would be carved and offerings would be brought before it. In Egyptian society, the ancestors were called Aku and were described as shining as gold in the belly of Nut. For that reason, they were, when entombed, depicted as golden stars on the ceiling of the tomb. A spirit did not become an Aku, a venerated ancestor, immediately upon death. The spirit had to undergo a 70-day journey through the other world or the Duat. This journey was quite dangerous for the spirit because there were many temptations and many traps laid out before the souls. Some of them became lost while others were feasted upon or tempted by demons. Once the journey was completed, the spirit would reach a large chamber called the Chamber of Two Truths before Anubis. Here, the heart of the individual would be weighed on a scale against a feather of Maat. Maat was the goddess of truth, justice, morality, balance, harmony and law. If the heart was in balance, then the spirit would be allowed to pass into Osiris's gardens the afterlife and enjoy paradise. Thus, a spirit would become a venerated ancestor or an Aku and would be able to accept offerings and be venerated. If the soul of the individual would become lost in the other world, in the Duat, or simply refuse to complete the journey and face Anubis, the spirit would become a Mutu, would become a restless dead. If the soul that reached Anubis was that of a truly evil individual and their heart would outweigh the feather, then the soul would be devoured by Amit, an ancient Egyptian goddess also known as the devourer of dead. She was represented as having the head of a crocodile, the four legs of a lion and the hind legs of a hippo the three most dangerous man-eating creatures in ancient Egypt. This was called a second death. Sometimes Amit would be represented as sitting in the middle of a lake of fire and the hearts of evil individuals would be thrown in this lake representing um, sacred destruction and purification through fire. The Book of the Dead is a series of texts that instruct the individual as to how to navigate the Duat upon death and how to reach Anubis and even the afterlife. 
as you can see, not everybody was worthy enough to become a venerated ancestor. In the Roman world, the Romans had nine days of celebration called Parentalia, and it took place in February, ending on the 22nd of the month. During this celebration, the Romans would honor their ancestors. And they did this by visiting cremation fields or cemeteries and sharing food and drinks and recounting memories of the deceased with friends and family. The parentalia would end on the 22nd with a special day called Cara Cognatio, a dinner during which old grudges would be resolved and family ties would be strengthened. All of this was done to honor the ancestors. Romans would also keep memorabilia from their deceased loved ones or their ancestors, be them personal effects or items of clothing. And in the case of the wealthier members of Roman society, they would keep either funerary masks made of plaster or wax, or even busts of their most prominent ancestors. These images, called imagine, would be kept in a special room dedicated to the honoring of the ancestors, called tablinium. Professional mourners would be employed to appease the soul of the deceased, and initially, gladiatorial shows were reserved for the funerals of elites. But that's another story for another time. On the 21st of February, public celebrations would be held in honor of ancestors, and sacrifices would be brought to the mains. Mains were souls that needed appeasing for one reason or another. You see mains mentioned on Roman tombstones or funerary stones in the phrase dis manibus or dm. This roughly translates to for the mains gods. Mains also appear in Dungeons and Dragons as being spirits of evildoers that have been cast into the abyss and have been shaped in the form of the lowest kind of demons. I actually painted three of these buggers not so long ago, link is over there. Now let's move to ancient China. In ancient China, people who wanted to venerate, to honor their ancestors could employ a sacrificial representative. They were called Shi, and during the ceremony they would become a vessel for the spirit and the soul of the deceased ancestor that was being honored. Thus, the ancestor was able to accept offerings brought to them, they would dine with their descendants and even convey spiritual messages. As you can see, this is a somewhat similar way of thinking, akin to that of the Egyptians who wanted to maintain the body so that the ancestor could return to it and accept offerings. In China, there were individuals who willingly allowed a spirit to possess them so that it can accept the offerings. For a very stark and interesting contrast, we need to move back to Europe, to the ancient Greeks, who for the most part believed that the spirits of the deceased would all descend to Hades, where they would continue a sort of existence as shades, regardless of the status they had while alive, and regardless of the deeds they carried out while living. Everyone, good, bad, wealthy, or poor, would all spend eternity in perpetual darkness and lament as shades. In their belief system, only a few were worthy enough to reach paradise and live among the gods. Usually, these individuals were either heroes, such as Achilles, or great leaders such as, for example, Alexander the Great. Over time, this belief evolved, like everything else connected to humanity. And by the 5th century BCE, the idea of a um, judgment phase was introduced in their beliefs. From that moment forward, slowly but surely, the idea that 
those worthy were separated for those unworthy started to permeate the Greek society. Now let's move back to Asia where we have in the Philippines the idea that the spirits of ancestors were guardian spirits. They were called Amito and shamans would be able to communicate and commune with these spirits and ask for guidance. Small carvings of the deceased would be created upon death called Tao Tao and they would be kept on a small altar in the household. With the passage of time and the Christian influences that were imposed by Spanish missionaries starting with the 16th century, before these carvings on the altar a lit candle would be kept. And with the invention of photography the small carvings would be replaced by photographs. Almost all, or better said, a lot of human communities and human cultures believe that the deceased requires items in the afterlife or during the journey towards the afterlife. They also share the belief that the spirit continues living on as it did on this plane, but now in paradise or in, well, hopefully in paradise. As such, most cultures bury their deceased with a trove of items. The Romans and the Greeks would place coins on the eyes or in the mouth of the deceased so that the spirit would have enough money to pay Charon, the ferryman, upon reaching the river Styx. I will have to do a video on the Greek and Roman afterlife as uh, both Hades and Tartarus and all of the rivers that cross them can be found and are part of the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse. But yet again, another story for another time. Both Romans and Greeks would also leave food and drinks in the tombs alongside some small personal items and jewelry. The ancient Egyptians would leave food, drinks, jewelry, clothing and furniture and other household items, even chariots for the deceased upon reaching the afterlife or in order to aid them while in the other world, in the Duat. The first emperor of China had the great Terracotta army sculpted for him so that they could accompany him in the afterlife. Others took mistresses and servants and wives and children with them in the afterlife. This was done either voluntarily with the people unliving themselves or done involuntarily with people being sacrificed so that they could follow their husband, brother, father or their master in the afterlife. This belief that the departed might benefit from having some items with them after death still survives to this day with small items, with clothing, with personal effects, clothing, shoes, even cars being buried with the deceased. This particular ritual, I'll call it, has in my opinion several purposes. First, the strong belief that the deceased actually needs those items. A second reason might be to show off. Another one might be a show of love and respect, while the other could be more cathartic, the idea of letting go of certain personal items of the deceased so that the surviving family or relatives could easily heal by ritually letting go of the deceased and their most personal belongings. Also, almost all cultures do have a ritual uh, feast in honor of the deceased. Sharing food and drinks, usually uh, the deceased most favorite food and drinks with friends and family. And most if not all human societies believe that the spirit of their ancestors are looking after them, protecting their surviving relatives, the whole community, or in some cases, all of humanity. Think about saints in the Judeo-Christian world. And one more important element that I think is at the root of 
ghost stories and the belief in ghosts is animism. Animism, in a very rough and incomplete way of putting it, is the belief that everything around us, all animals, all items, and even places, have a spirit of their own. This belief has accompanied humanity from its infancy. And, if we are honest, it never actually went away. Even to this day, there is the belief that an artist, an artisan, a craftsman, a sculptor, a painter, a musician leaves behind a piece of their soul in their creation, making it more valuable. Samurais believe that their swords and their weapons had a soul. Indigenous people from across the world believe that animals and places and even natural weather phenomenon have spirits. And it's not limited to prehistory, antiquity or the Middle Ages, and it's not limited to indigenous people. Here's a mundane example for you. How many of you name your cars or your favorite tools? I know I do. My car's name is Twig. My father's car name was Marcus. Twig is rather um, sensitive and a little bit aggressive and I always have to rein him in because he kind of likes to go fast with the slightest push of the pedal. Marcus, on the other hand, was a little bit slower and sturdier. We, as a species, always anthropomorphize the objects around us. We assign human traits to inanimate objects or to animals. We instinctively believe that everything around us has something that might pass as a lower-ranking soul, if that makes sense. Animism has been with us from the beginning of humanity and will be with us far into the future. And it is a catalyst for believing in ghosts. If we are willing to believe that everything around us has a soul, an essence, and if we are willing to believe that there is an afterlife, a good place, a bad place, and perhaps even a place in between, then by default, in my opinion, we will always believe that there is a way that souls do not cross over completely or that they can return. And with that segue, let us talk about actual ghosts, especially the evil ones. But before we do so, if you've reached this far into the video, make sure you hit that like button as it helps this channel tremendously. Oh, and before we start talking about the miniature, if you want more adventures that Mango and Potato, my lovely two assistants, have throughout their normal busy days, make sure you visit my wife's channel, TW Creative hyphen or minus cats. I promise that it contains a lot of cats and no history. Now, let's go to the miniatures. As I mentioned, when I laid out my plants for the minis, I used acrylic inks on the Nightmare. Initially, I painted in one of its hind legs just to taste the ink. Then I went in with vermilion and started painting in the fiery tears in its skin and went in with black ink trying to be careful and not cover the vermilion. I quickly realized that it would take me too long and it would be too messy to try and avoid the tears when I applied the ink, so I gave up. I slept on black and then went in with vermilion again to paint the tears. Good thing that inks dry fairly quick and they do not bleed, allowing for great cover. It looks awesome, at least in my opinion. Now I need to paint the base and bring everything together. Welcome back. Let's talk about spirits, mostly malevolent. One of the first mentions of an evil spirit comes from the Assyrians from 2000 BCE, so more than 4000 years ago, from the Epic of Gilgamesh. The spirit in question was called an Ekimu, or the departed spirit, and it was a soul that could not find rest. The spirit was that of an individual who died an untimely death, usually violent, either being murdered or died in battle, or died by exposure to the elements, especially in the desert. Thus, their body was left unburied. This made the spirit return and torment the living. 
if it was the spirit of somebody murdered, the spirit would have a psychic link to their murderer or murderers and would be able to always know where they were. They would use the psychic link to find their murderers and take up residence in their home, slowly draining the life essence of both the culprit and their relatives. In the end, this led to the death of all the household members. If death occurred in battle or by exposure to elements and the body was left unburied, the only way to release such a spirit was to conduct special appeasement rituals. Also likely to return were the spirits of those who weren't taken care after death or were improperly buried or the rites of burial were not properly followed. Or those who had unfinished business. Unfortunately, this could mean basically anyone, but also a way of making sure that all rites and rituals were properly followed. The best protection against an Akimu was prayer, or according to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, a saving throw. Now let's jump forward in time to the ancient Greeks, where Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey mentions ghosts or shades that were summoned forth to offer prophecies and advice, and once those who summoned them were done, they would return to the earth as vapor while gibbering and whining. And as I've mentioned before, as all things around humans, they evolved. And by the 5th century, when the idea of the division between the worthy and the unworthy in the afterlife, Ghosts started becoming more frightening and they needed food and drinks to be appeased. The ancient work of fiction, Oresteia, written by Aeschylus in the 5th century BCE, is the first work of fiction where a ghost is described. This is the ghost of Clytemnestra, Agamemnon's wife, and according to some legends, his assassin. Another kind of evil spirit or ghost are shadows or shadow people. They are shadows that seem to move of their own volition and usually are observed at the periphery of vision. They do not have distinguishable facial features and when individuals try to actively look for them, they vanish. They may pass through walls or doors and instill a sense of dread upon those who are in close proximity. Or on those through whom the shadow passes. They are believed to be spirits unwilling or unable to move on, others believe they are demons, and most exotic, there are those who believe shadows and shadow people to be creatures from another dimension that overlaps ours. In most superstitions, they do not harm the living, but there are some in which they are very cruel and vicious tormenting and ripping apart their victims. Then we have specters. These are entities who are represented as being angry and hateful spirits who were held back from crossing over to the afterlife through curses or magic. Then we have wraiths. No, not those wraiths. They are somewhat strange in their origin story because they are considered to be or said to be humans who have been consumed and devoured by dark desires and corruption. They search for ways to attain immortality or to temper with time itself. It is said that their spells have gone horribly wrong and upon reaching the moment of their death they call upon dark entities to save them, help them. It is said that once their life force is consumed and snuffed out, their spirit lingers, stronger and more cruel, carrying out their original purpose, but bound to the entity that has helped them when they reached out. The best example are the ring wraiths from Lord of the Rings. They are the incarnation of anger, hatred and despair. They are often described as wearing hooded dark robes that obscure their silhouettes. Their arms are either skeletal or very thin, 
and their face is either skeletal or a dark void. Another good example of these creatures are, in my opinion, and I think I'm not wrong, the Dementors from Harry Potter. There are two other kinds of wraiths in folklore. One of them is a demonic parasite that in a very insidious and very subtle way possesses humans and most of the times the victim does not even know they have been possessed. They can procreate and once the human they inhabit has children, a part of this demonic parasite attaches to the child and the child becomes a blood child. And then we have the Voror in Germanic and Slavic folklore. They are also known as Wardens or Watchers. And they are said to guard people from birth until death. Let's talk about Will-O-Wisps now. Or their medieval Latin name Ignis Fatus. These are ghost lights that appear in bogs, marshes and swamps. According to folklore, there are ghost lights that confuse travelers and lead them into very dangerous terrain where usually they get lost and die. There are several stories that try to explain and are at the root of Will-O-Wisps. One of them is about a smith named Will. He led such a vicious and evil life that upon reaching heaven's gates, Saint Peter is shocked at his behavior and decides to send him back and give him a second chance. Upon coming back to earth, Will, instead of leading a better, a more wholesome life, he doubles down. Upon reaching the gates of heaven a second time, St. Peter is so appalled that he denies Will entrance and curses him to roam the land. The devil, impressed with Will's conduct and life, gives him a burning coal from the heart of hell to keep him warm while he roams the land eternally. Will, instead of using it to warm himself, he crafts it into a lantern and starts luring innocent travelers in swampy areas where they die. In another story, the original Will-O-Wisp is a drunkard called Jack, who manages to trick the devil in paying his bar tab. He then tricks the devil two more times when the devil comes to collect his soul, and the devil is both impressed and angry and gives him a piece of eternally burning coal, but curses him to forever roam the land, not allowing him in hell. Jack creates a lantern made out of a turnip in which he places the coal and roams the swamps and bogs and marshes, luring perhaps by mistake innocent travelers. In other stories, Willowis are actually the souls and spirits of children who died unbaptized, and in essence, they lure travelers in water in hopes of being baptized. Other stories have them be uh, lanterns that the fairy folk use to confuse and attract and lure travelers, and once the travelers are off the beaten path, the fairy folk extinguish the lamps and thus the travelers are lost and usually die in swamps and marshes and bogs. And there is one more meaning of a will-o'-wisp, a more metaphorical meaning, especially in literature. They represent an unobtainable goal, a goal that leads someone on, even on dark and sinister paths. In Asia, there are tales that will-o'-wisps are actually the souls of drowned fishermen who either lure other fishermen to their death or actually try to warn them of the danger. But most likely, they are bioluminescent or chemiluminescent natural phenomena caused by different compounds resulting from decaying organic matter in swamps and marshes. 
Since we're in Asia, let's talk about India, where we have the Buddha. The Buddha is the soul of a man who died an untimely death, and he walks around reanimating corpses and feasting on the living akin to a ghoul. They are also said to be able to possess living individuals and affect their bodies and their minds. What's interesting about the Buddha is that in folklore, if an individual isn't afraid of the Buddha, they can't be affected by one. In northern India, we have the Brahms. These are male ghosts that can uh, enact vengeance by inflicting leprosy. We also have the Kurail, a female a spirit that takes revenge by inducing miscarriages. We also have the Vetala, an entity that is able to possess corpses and feasts upon children and induces miscarriages. But in some cases, uh, they are said to guard villages. And now let's come back to um, Europe where we have the Geists. This is a German word for what the Latins called spiritus. At its root, the word Geist means to be agitated or frightened. And this is how we get to the poltergeist or the noisy spirit. These are spirits that are responsible for knocking in the night, for rearranging furniture and for destroying objects. They are also described as being able to interact with the living, biting, scratching, hitting, tripping them. And at the heart of this legend lies a child, usually a creepy little girl, that wants attention and obtains it by scaring the living crap out of people. We also have the Banshee, a female spirit that announces the death of a family member by screaming, wailing and shrieking. The name Banshee comes from Old Irish and means Woman of the Fairy Mound. And that kind of covers the most well-known, most prominent ghosts, at least in today's episode. There are so many ghost stories and so many ghost tales that it's very hard or time-consuming to cover them all. And even if we try, I assure you, we're gonna miss more than half of them. Now, let's take one more look at the miniatures before we start wrapping things up. Using pure Zendry dust, I am painting the robe the Bodak is wearing, trying to apply highlights only directly from above, leaving a lot of shadows in place. I am using a very thin brush and I am taking my time trying not to mess things up and make sure the light is realistic, or as realistic as I can paint it. This is quite a laborious stage and I am really enjoying it, especially because I'm trying something new and I'm listening to some really interesting videos about coffee. I was wondering, what are you good folks listening to when painting or sculpting or whatever, especially during the meticulous stages? I'm really curious, so don't be shy, leave a comment below. Welcome back. Let's try and explain some of the um, phenomena that are at the heart of ghost stories as there are many floating out there, pun intended. First, let's talk about a psychological condition called hypnogogia. Hypnogogia is a condition where a person is in a state that is half awake and half asleep. While in this state, individuals are aware of their environment and at the same time they are in a dreamlike state where they receive images and other stimuli from their subconscious mind. They perceive these images as being real and similar to sleep paralysis, people that experience this um, report having a sense of immense dread that is accompanied by moving shadows or flickering lights or any other visual hallucinations. Hypnogogia could be a way of explaining shadow people, but it's not able to explain um, hallucinations that appear during the day or while the individuals are um, allegedly wide awake. Skeptics attribute shadow people to nothing more than 
overactive imaginations or neurological disorders that can trigger hallucinations or other visual disturbances. Unfortunately, other explanations for the sighting of ghosts could be degenerative neurological diseases such as dementia or Alzheimer's disease. There are some um, medicine and some plants that aid with sleeping that can lead to hallucinations. There are also plants that are linked with different rituals, both shamanic or necromantic, that have the capability of inducing hallucinations. Another explanation could be the fact that, like nowadays, people throughout history enjoy taking the edge off just a little using alcohol or plants or, in the case of Romans, hallucinogenic fish. In my humble opinion, um, ghosts, like many other dark creatures, are the result of overactive imaginations or they are used as a tool by bards and doorkeepers to propagate very important life lessons, um, such as methods of dealing with the dead, rituals that need to be properly implemented, good practices of dealing with the dead and death in general, good practices when it came to burying bodies or cremating them, good practices in purification after coming in contact with dead bodies, both of those who handled them and of the household where the individual lived, and also making sure that the family ties are kept intact. These were also methods uh, for parents to scare the living shit out of their children and have them behaving. They were also methods of trying to explain the inexplicable, strange sounds in the night, the sense of being stalked, and perhaps even, sadly enough, an attempt at explaining the strange behavior of certain members in the community, such as people who became murderers or serial killers, and it would have been easier to explain that they were possessed by evil spirits rather than facing the reality that those individuals somehow flipped and went on a rampage. There is also the possibility of carbon monoxide intoxications. Intoxication with carbon monoxide leads to headaches, illnesses, a sense of dread, hallucinations and eventually death. For the longest of times, people kept warm by having hearths in their own homes, and if the area wasn't properly ventilated, carbon monoxide intoxication was a very common and unfortunately deadly occurrence. And in the end, there is one more explanation, that of these apparitions being the figment of the imagination of a very tired mind. Tell me, has it ever happened for you to be so tired that the world around you seems to wobble and warp? Well, there you go. You see ghosts. Just make sure that next time you go to bed earlier. When we can't trust our own senses, ghosts and other dark creatures tend to appear more often. There is also a pattern when it comes to places where these kind of sightings tend to crop up more often. First, we have roads. On roads, ghosts tend to be lost travelers. People who were killed or simply died while traveling to their destination, thus linking to unfinished business, linking to the Ekimu. We also have old houses, where tragic events have taken place at one point, such as a mysterious murder that went unsolved, linking to the idea of unfinished business and the desire for vengeance or justice, or a house where somebody unlived themselves, linking to a violent, mysterious death. Ghosts tend to appear on battlefields, where, of course, we have violent deaths or deaths by exposure to the elements, in the case of survivors, wounded survivors. Usually, the bodies on battlefields were left uncared for. That's why even nowadays, there are, in case of catastrophes or 
accidents with multiple casualties where bodies aren't found, there are some purification rituals and ceremonies and sermons to appease the souls and make sure that they move on. We have ghosts at sea in the form of ghost ships. Again, exposure to the elements, untimely violent deaths and unfinished business. They also seem to crop up around cemeteries. Of course, this is because for us as humans, Cemeteries are places where the dead reside. By definition, cremation fields and cemeteries are scary places and bad omens, reminding us of our own eventual inevitable departure from this realm. And they seem to appear in hospitals because, unfortunately for us, hospitals are not places of healing and hope. They are places of pain, suffering and death. And, of course, such as in the case of cemeteries, they are reminders of our fragility and our inevitable end. All of these entities have a very comfy and well-established place in our cultures and in movies, TTRPGs, video games and in books. And, to be honest, I'm really curious how you are using and depicting ghosts in your creative work, if you actually use them somehow. If you do so, make sure you leave a comment below and we can chat about it. To be honest, I really enjoyed making this video, especially talking about um, honoring the ancestors as it reminded me of my early years in university when I had anthropology courses. At one point I will discuss in more details how different societies cared for their um, deceased, but you know the drill, that's another story for another time. Now, if you've reached this far into the video, make sure that the like button is highlighted and if you found value in this video make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you are notified when the next video comes out until then thank you so much for the privilege of your time i truly hope that you found some inspiration and learned something new today and i can't wait to see you all here next week on funky monkey mp the place where you get your weekly dose of miniature painting history and world building have yourselves a wonderful wonderful day Cheers.